心。
是成正回答。Welcome to、uh, the Buddhist Research Center of Peking University. I'm Yu Zhao, your moderator for today's Yinchen Distinguished Lecture in Buddhist Studies. This online lecture series is a collaborative, multi-university partnership between Harvard University, Princeton University, Columbia University, the University of British Columbia, Oxford University, Cambridge University, and Peking University. It is established in honor of Uh, Venerable Zheng Yan, the founder of Ziji, and her mentor Venerable Yin Shun, with the goal to promote Buddhist studies in contemporary society. The lecture is conducted via Zoom webinar and live stream via YouTube with simultaneous English and Mandarin channels. The lecture is also recorded and will be available online. I'm now very delighted to introduce our distinguished. Uh, speaker today, Professor、uh, Natasha Heller, a cultural historian of Chinese Buddhism at the University of Virginia. Professor Heller is known for her groundbreaking work, including *Illusionary Abiding*, a captivating study of the eminent Chan monk Zhongfen Mingwen during the Yuan Dynasty. Her exploration of poetry, calligraphy, and Gongwan commentary unveils the social and cultural dimensions of Chan Buddhism. Additionally, her upcoming monograph, *Literature for Little Bodhisattvas*, delves into the inventive corpus of Buddhist children's literature in modern Taiwan. This work illuminates how authors and illustrators engage with scriptures, commentaries, and visual traditions against the backdrops of global modernity. I believe today's talk comes from the fruit of this second monograph project. Currently, Professor Hell is also working on a third book examining the significance of trees in Chinese Buddhism. Um, as a tree lover, I'm especially looking forward to that project.、Um, after Professor Heller's、uh, Professor Heller's insightful talk on our entangled others, ecology, and Buddhist storytelling, we'll gain further perspectives from Venerable De Yuan and Professor、uh, Lei Yin. Our first discussant is Venerable De Yuan. Chairman of Yayasan Pendidigan、uh, Zuji Malaysia and Chairman of Zuji Foundation Canada, she's fluent in Mandarin, English, and Malaysian Malay.、Um, she was born and raised in the small town of Kondian,、uh, Kondian. I'm not sure I, I pronounce it correctly. Malaysia.、Um, she holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical、um, engineering、um, and worked as a product engineer. But later drawn by Tama Master Jaya's compassion during the disaster relief efforts for the Typhoon Nari and the Nanwan Wan attacks, Venerable Dewan became a novice in 2009 and was ordained in 2011. Her international presence includes speaking at conferences such as、um, 2018 PWR at Toronto, Canada, and the 2019 China U.S. Canada Buddhist Forum and New York United States. Our second discussant,、uh, Professor Lei Yin. Uh, received her PhD from Harvard University as a presidential scholar,、um, specialized in the interdisciplinary study of religion and literature.、Uh, Professor Lane、um, focuses on the interconnection between Buddhism and modern Chinese literary and intellectual history. Her current book project, "Our Shared Karma: Buddhism, Literature, and the Modern Chinese Revolution." Challenges the secularist assumption underlying the received narrative of China's modern transformation. Her works have been、uh, featured in esteemed journals、um, such as um, um, Journal of Asian Studies,、uh, New Literary History of Modern China, Religions, etc. She is currently teaches teaching、um, Chinese and Buddhist literature at Amherst College. After their responses to Professor、um, Helen's lecture, we'll open the floor、um, to questions from the audience. 
Okay, before we start, um, I'd like to thank um, uh, Zhu Chi Foundation for sponsoring this series and to Professor Tinghua Chen, Vicky and Carol for maintaining this network. And of course, to Dr. He and Professor uh, Wang Sun for their invaluable contributions. And before moving to our lecture properly, let's welcome them to share just a few words um, about this collaboration. First, let's uh, welcome Professor Wang Sun, uh, the director of the Buddhist Research Center of Peking University to share some of his thoughts on this collaboration, please. Thank you, Professor Zhao Yu. Uh, dear Professor Heller, Venerable De Yuan, Professor Lei Ying, thank you very much for attending the Yingzheng Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, this is the third lecture held by our center in this series. On behalf of the Buddhist Research Center at Peking University, I would like to express my sincere thanks to you all. I also want to thank my colleague, Professor Zhao Yu, and Ted and his fellows coming from the Ciji Charity Foundation for their wonderful organization. And of course, I want to thank our online audience for their participation. Thank you, and welcome your continued support in the future. Finally, I would like to invite Dr. and Professor Rui Shenghe, Vice CEO of Ciji Charity Foundation, to say a few words on behalf of our sponsor of this series. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Wang Song. It's a great honor to have uh, uh, Professor uh, Natasha Heder to present uh, her talk. And also I have to uh, sincere uh, gratitude to um, Buddhist Research Center of Peking University, especially Professor Wang and Professor Zhao Yu devote to this lecture series and also uh, welcome uh, uh, Dharma Master De Yuan from Jing Si Bo and also Professor Ying Lei uh, from Empress uh, University. And I think uh, today's lecture is uh, very, very fascinating. As we all know that um, the topic is about the our entangled others, Buddhism and multi-faith species storytelling. Buddhism cherish all essential being is the utmost philosophy and mercy to all beings because everything is interdependent. And meanwhile, practically Buddhism also believe that we all have a living in consecutive multi-life. Some of our life were animals. So I think uh, Professor Natasha Heder will give us her insight and research. And we are very delightful to listen to her lecture and all the discussions command. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, Professor Watson. Thank you, uh, Dr. He. Uh, without further delay, uh, now let's embark on this uh, enlightening and exciting journey with Professor Heller. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, just give me a moment to make sure that I can share my screen um, yeah. and start the presentation because I think I have some images that will make this um, mm. more entertaining and more um, illuminating. So does everything look good? Yeah, yeah. perfect. Okay. Thank you. First of all, yeah. I want to start by thanking um, thanking the the Tsuji Foundation for sponsoring this lecture series, um, thanking uh, all of you for this invitation to speak today and for the very kind in introductory remarks. I also want to uh, thank the audience and everyone joining all across, uh, it seems like all across the world. We, I know that there are people from France, Taiwan, China, and so forth, uh, and where I think we're all in different time zones, uh, so that this is a, a really sort of special moment where we can all come together uh, to talk about what I think are really compelling issues. Um, so with that, I will begin. Um, and you can see that the title of my talk, it's it appeared in a couple of different places differently, but is it Are Entangled Others? Buddhism and Multispecies Storytelling. So let me begin with two stories and I'll be telling a number of stories throughout this talk. The first opens with a pair of brothers who have very different approaches to life. One single-mindedly pursues business and money-making and the other becomes a Buddhist. The Buddhist oriented brother dies, I'm sorry, the business oriented brother dies first while the other brother becomes an accomplished Dharma master. 
Going out one morning, this brother, the Dharma master, encounters an old ox being driven to market. Although he healthy in appearance, the ox is moving too slowly uh, for, for its master, who beats him with increasingly increasing fervor until the ox falls to his knees. The ox has tears running from his eyes and is lowing sadly and seems to address the monk. Entering into a meditative state, the monk is able to see that the ox is none other than the reincarnation of his brother. He then persuades the ox's owner to give him the ox. The ox lives out his life at the temple, absorbing the Buddhist teachings. The second story is a bit shorter. It concerns a monk who has a cow. Every day, the cow gives three liters of milk, and one day, someone comes by to beg for some milk. The cow then opens its mouth and speaks, explaining that in a past life, she was a slave who stole food meant for monks, and thus, in this life, her milk is given only for this one particular monk. She has no more milk to give beyond the repayment of her debt. So one of these stories is from a children's picture book published in Taiwan in 2005. The other one is from a 10th century text attributed there to a much earlier medieval source. The stories share important elements. In both cases, bovine rebirth is directly connected to behaviors in the human life that preceded it. And in both cases, rebirth happens within a community, extending connections across lives. The chief difference is that the medieval cow talks. The children's book may well be a retelling of or a variation on a rebirth story that had been long in circulation uh, and then was deemed to have value for contemporary times as explicated by Venerable Jungyan at the story's close. Uh, it's actually animals talking or not talking that was the starting point for this paper. Um, my book on Taiwanese Buddhist picture books that was mentioned in the introduction, um, it's a title of literature for little bodhisattvas. It's due out next year. And in the process of researching it, I read any number of books with talking animals. That animals have conversations with each other and sometimes with humans too is commonplace in children's literature. When I returned to the story of the brother, brother reincarnated as an ox, you know, I read it you know, several years ago and came back to it as I was preparing this paper, I was surprised to find that the ox didn't speak. The text reads, this is my translation, it seemed as if he wanted to speak to the Dharma master, end quote, but the ox can do no more than sort of moo sadly. The reader's ability to understand the ox is based on this and the affecting illustration of the ox looking upward with a tear in its eye. The ox's backstory is ascertained only through the meditative prowess of his brother. Why not have the ox speak, I wondered, given that picture book readers are primed to expect this. Um, and while the answer in this case is not all that important, I don't even think that we can resolve it, the question made me interested in how humans and non-human animals interacted in different types of Buddhist stories. So for my purposes today, I want to think beyond generic and temporal boundaries, instead treating Buddhist literature as a whole, as a resource for ecological storytelling. So here I want to flag what I am doing methodologically by bringing contemporary works into conversation with earlier texts. Um, in my book coming out next year, I connect historical sources to contemporary picture books to show how the latter continue or alter theories, themes in earlier Buddhist literature. I treat picture books as a distinct genre of Buddhist literature, as we might treat Jataka tales or scripture or commentary and so forth. For this talk, what I would like to propose is an experiment in reading animal stories of all sorts so as to better understand how Buddhist storytelling might contribute to cross-species thinking in an age of climate crisis. To do so, I will propose a working typology of stories to help us consider their potential contributions and their limits for a more than human ethics that cultivates empathetic imagination. Before outlining my typology, I want to unpack some of the terms I've just used as a means to orient my discussion today. First of all, I use the term storytelling to encompass the many ways that Buddhists have offered narratives. These include Jataka tales, accounts of strange and miraculous events, and picture books. I am not so much concerned with distinguishing authenticity or veracity from fictionalization, um, but with the way that storytelling aims to produce effects. I think Buddhist storytelling, however entertaining, always intends that the audience learn something. And often what is learned is then meant to lead to action. 
The, the term storytelling encompasses multiple forms of narratives and emphasizes that this is a process meant to reshape how people think about their worlds. For pre-modern Buddhists, uh, storytelling was often meant to point people away from undesirable behaviors such as meat eating and towards more meritorious ones. Uh, writing in our own times, authors and critics have recognized the importance of telling stories that reorient human action in the context of the climate crisis. By now, it is well accepted that human activities have fundamentally altered global ecosystems with a range of effects, warming temperatures, more wet bulb days, longer and more frequent droughts, more severe storms, vast forest fires, water and air pollution that shortens humans, human lives, biodiversity loss, and so forth. And although humans have always altered their environments, the pace of change now is both disorienting and demands response. Noting that the novel as the dominant genre of modern literature developed in tandem with the Industrial Revolution, Amitav Ghosh has articulated the stakes um, for literature in the present moment. He writes in The Great Derangement, climate change events are particularly resilient to the customary frames that literature has applied to nature. They are too powerful, too grotesque, too dangerous, and too accusatory to be written about in a lyrical el or elegiac or romantic vein. We are confronted suddenly with a new task, that of finding other ways in which to imagine the unthinkable beings and events of this era. Ghosh goes on to point out that non-human agency has often played a significant role in the narratives, especially epics, of Asia, Africa, and the Mediterranean. And in that the Anthropocene has forced us to recognize that there are other fully aware eyes looking over our shoulders, we might find resources for our present times in these various other narrative traditions. The Anthropocene, that is our present geologic age, defined as one in which human activity has significantly shaped the environment, is a result of unquestioned anthropocentric perspectives. The belief that human beings are at the center of a world are at the center of the world facilitated a set of actions, industrialization, resource extraction, that have led to our cir current circumstances. If we are to move away from anthropocentrism and find new ways of thinking through our world, narratives that incorporate non-human perspectives offer one important approach. This is an endeavor with ethical implications. To see the world from different perspectives also opens the way for understanding um, different kinds of obligations. One way to think about those obligations is through the idea of entanglement, that we are enmeshed in complex relationships with other humans and other beings. And I think this is familiar to anyone who knows anything about Buddhism, right? Um, so the phrase entangled others in the title of my talk, however, um, invokes Laurie Gruen's concept of entangled empathy, which he articulates in a brief book of the same name. Gruen develops the idea of entangled empathy in response to thinkers who she believes do not adequately consider the experiences of suffering animals and who she believes espouse what she would call traditional ethical theories, uh, which remain anthropocentric and often arrogantly so in their orientation. In contrast, Gruen argues that entangled empathy requi requires toggling between two points of view or different points of view, the first person and the third person, self and other. She writes, entangled empathy is a process that it, uh, involves integrating a range of thoughts and feelings to try to get an accurate take on the situation of another and figure out what, if anything, we are called upon to do. This is by no means easy, and Gruen empath emphasizes that it is a process that takes practice. Real encounters such as with companion animals or Emma, the chimpanzee Gruen gets to know in the course of her research, help give us the skills in understanding the quote, situation of another, which then can be extended to other others more distant. Throughout her short book, Gruen notes the potential of storytelling to help us develop new forms of empathy. Reasoning from storied empathy, when children empathize with fictional characters, Gruen asserts that narrative, literature, art, and storytelling are a means to engage with very different others. 
So connecting this with Gauche's and others called for new kinds of stories for a time of climate crisis, we might ask how different types of stories told about animal others work to develop empathy and what, in Gruen's terms, epistemic or ethical inaccuracies they might have. Conversely, we might ask what kinds of stories would facilitate the development of the kind of entangled empathy necessary in the Anthropocene. To return now to Buddhist storytelling, the materials I have read suggest to me three types of narratives. And I don't mean to imply that these are the only types of narratives that we could identify, and I would welcome suggestions for how we might sort of expand and think about other types of narratives that we would find in these stories. But the three I came up with are as follows. The first type of stories are those stories of unidirectional concern in which a human being exercises compassion towards animals. These stories do not suggest any special connections between their human protagonist and the non-human animal, and they center the human's behavior as praiseworthy. The second type of story is one of anxious entanglement. In these stories, human animals and non-human animals are connected through reincarnation in ways, as we will see, that are not entirely comfortable for either side. Animals are shown to be anxious about being subject to human choices, while human beings are worried by the prospect of a lower rebirth, among other concerns. Finally, a third category of stories I call transposed perspectives. And in these, uh, we uh, viewers, uh, readers are asked to take the viewpoint of non-human animals, imagining what the world looks like through their eyes. To begin with stories of unidirectional concern, the Jataka story of Prince Mahasattva sacrificing himself to feed a tigress, who is so starved as to seem to be ready to eat her own cubs, is a clear example. Um, so in mo the, the general uh, narrative goes like this. The prince uh, initially lays down in front of the tiger, but she is not enticed to eat him alive. To make himself food-like and appetizing, the prince then slits his own throat and throws himself off a cliff, which produces the desired effect. This is an act of extreme compassion, and that it crosses species boundaries makes it all the more so. Tigers, after all, are a lower rebirth than humans and are associated with violence. This particular tiger, looking hungrily at her own offspring, ex exemplifies the worst of animal instincts. That Prince Mahasattva was willing to sacrifice himself for a beast such as this marks his compassion as extraordinary and exemplary. And so we are not surprised to discover that Prince Mahasattva is none other than the Buddha in a prior life. Now, there are various versions of the story that elaborate it and, and tell it in slightly different ways. And I have emphasized in my brief retelling of this Jataka, the virtue of compassion. And of course, these stories serve to drive home how exceptional the Buddha was, both in the length of the Bodhisattva path and how much he exceeded human moral obligations, even in past lives. But let's think about how else we might read the story. The most salient detail is that the tiger is starving. In some versions, the tiger is starving because she has just given birth and is too weak to go hunting. Whether the tiger's hunter, hun, hunger is caused by child, uh, childbirth birth of her cubs or not, it would, there would seem to be disruptions that lead to her malnourishment. She is unable to catch enough prey to sustain her increased nutritional needs. This suggests that her forest home is an environment out of balance. Were this happening in our own time, we would rightly suspect that the lack of readily available prey was the result of human actions, either through overhunting or through encroachment on the tiger's territory. Although the prince does not comment on the on possible secondary causes of the tiger's hunger, that's not really the point of the story, he sees her as another living being to whom he has some responsibility. I'm not suggesting here that this Jataka supports an ecological reading. Clearly the tale is uh, anthropocentric in orientation focused on the actions of Prince Mahasattva. But we do see um, the Bodhisattva exemplifying entangled empathy expressed through his salvific efforts. Illustrations can provide us other ways and possibly viewpoints into these stories. I already mentioned the illustrations of the cow with a tear in its eye. And before I turn from this story, I want to highlight the fact that it exists in visual, visual form as well. To note just one example, um, there are several murals uh, in the Mogao caves that have uh, or have have this uh, story in them. Uh, that in cave 428, 
includes uh, the, pri the scene, primary scene of sacrifice, but also two other parts of the story, namely the first unsuccessful offering of the body, and even before that, the starving tiger with her cubs. Um, and this image I find really compelling because the tiger you can see sort of sits awkwardly with her mouth hanging open, her eyes staring straight ahead while the cubs gamble about her. Um, the three princes are there just outside of the detail, uh, they're just outside of the detail I have here. But it's, I think, a, a sense of the tiger's perspective. It's a scene of hunger. It may be that the painter, it may even be likely that the painter never saw a tiger, yet tries to conjure up what a hungry one would look like. And this allows the viewer similar imaginative possibilities. Acts of compassion need not be carried out by exceptional individuals like bodhisattvas to have exceptional effects as we learn in a story about a very young novice who sees even insects as worthy of his concern. Uh, the Little Shamanera Saves Ants, um, which is in a collection published by Beautiful Life Television, a media subsidiary of Fogongshan, elaborates on a tale found in the Sutra of the Storehouse of Assorted Treasures, uh, Zabaldong Jing, and it begins in the hazy past. This story goes a lot, begins, and this is my translation of the children's book, uh, version. Uh, a long time ago, in a secluded forest, there was an eight-year-old Shamanera who followed an eminent monk who had gained the way, and at their temple they lived the simple but hard white working lives of those who have left home." End quote. The young Shamanera is praised for his attentiveness to the eminent monk, both in what he learns from him and in his deep concern that the older monk not do any more work than necessary. The plot really begins when the elderly monk enters into a meditative state, Ru Ding, in which he sees that the Shramanera only has seven more days to live. The monk muses on the impermanence of human life and how such a clever young child is not fated to live very long. The monk concludes that he must send the young boy home to his mother rather than letting him die in the forest temple. He does not tell all this to the novice, framing the trip home as simply a matter of the child not having seen his mother for a long time. The young boy's trip through the forest is a happy one as he enjoys hearing the birds and looking at the scenery all around him. Partway through his journey, he comes across a puddle and notices some ants have become stranded and are in danger of drowning. The novice devises a bridge out of a tree branch and he makes little boats out of leaves and he manages to get all the ants to safety. Giving them words of encouragement, he continues on his way. And the way he speaks to the ants conveys his capacity for imagining the experiences of other beings. He spends seven happy days with his mother and then on the eighth day sets off to return to the forest temple. When the old monk glimpses him at the distance, he is very much surprised to see him alive. Well, why hasn't the little Shramanera died? My whole life I have predicted events with supernatural reliability and I've never made an error. Is this his ghost coming back? And that's, that was a quote from the, the children's book. Um, the original is extremely short. Uh, once again, the elderly monk enters into a state of meditative concentration. There he sees the young boy rescue the ants and emerging from meditation comments, the ancients had a saying, saving a person's life is better than building a seven story stupa. Because he saved so many lives, the young boy is destined to live a long and fortunate life. And this prediction only increases his desire to do good in the world. Although it is not spelled out, it seems that the monk's initial vision was correct. It seems unlikely that he would have fallible supernatural powers and that the boy has managed to alter his fate through his act of kindness to ants. This is a story of karma or cause and effect realized within a condensed period of time, shorter even than a single lifetime. Good deeds can literally save your life. So if I can digress just very, very briefly, the elderly monk believes the young boy's fate is fixed, yet the little boy's compassion completely undoes this fate. Uh, and here, I think we might even see a, a parallel to climate predictions. Exceeding 1.5 degrees of warming may seem inevitable, but perhaps the effects of our actions may be, far, be more far reaching than they appear. This kind of narrative of unidirectional concerns gives a, an imaginative framing to such a hope that fates can be written, rewritten with enough good effort. Although I categorize this story as one of unidirectional concern, what allowed the child to save the ants was his ability to imagine how they felt. The story conveys his empathy for them through a long section in which he speaks to them after all the ants have reached safety. 
The book in which this story is found, you can see it on the screen, also includes another story that explicitly identifies empathetic imagination as the quality that allows for the compassionate care of non-human animals. This story revolves around the rescue of two chicks who were found in the rain and then singed by the uh, family's cooking stove. The little boy of the family takes care of them, prioritizing their well-being uh, over even playing with friends. Through his dedication, the injured chicks grow to adulthood. Uh, when asked how he managed to rear them so successfully, he replies, I don't have any magical methods. I just made myself into a chick and from their position saw and thought about things. For all matters, I simply imagined on their behalf, end quote. Uh, we will look further at ways stories make readers into animals when we turn to tales of transposed narratives. The second type of story that I want to talk about is that of anxious entanglement narratives about how people and animals are bound together through reincarnation. Beyond the fact of connection over more than one lifetime, these stories uh, also show the possibility of cross-species communication and recognition. Such stories are like those with which I began, in which cows or oxen turn out to be reincarnated humans proximate to other characters and connected from a prior life. Um, as the teaching uh, of Karma and rebirth developed in China, recompense came to be understood as happening in three different time frames: retribution in the present, retribution in one's next rebirth, and retribution in the future. In terms of stories told about retribution, those um, told about the next rebirth, I think, pack a, a kind of special narrative punch, a kind of middle point between new, being too near and this potentially less interesting and too far, uh, which could blur the, the lines of causation. Um, and in this section, I'm going to be talking about a number of, uh, begin by talking about a number of uh, medieval uh, stories from the medieval period, beginning with uh, Tong Lin, who uh, a, an author who was active in the mid seventh century, uh, wrote a record of post mortem, -mortem retribution, uh, the Ming Bao Ji. Um, and in this text, there is a tale of a man who refuses to pay workers who built him a house. And he even goes so far as to whip them when they asked for their wages. Um, he, one worker declares, if you are really going to go back on your obligation, then when you die, you can be my ox. The man does die and a cow belonging to the stiffed worker becomes preg pregnant. The calf she gives birth to is ma marked by a black stripe um, uh, around its belly and a vertical white patch on its left leg. And these are interpreted by everybody who sees the, the calf to resemble the waistband um, and the tablet held by officials during audiences. So this connects it to the, uh, the man who wouldn't pay them. To further confirm the ox's identity, the worker confronts it by name. In response, the animal kneels down and knocks its head on the ground. These important details show that connections between past and present lives are manifest in physical features and that humans and animals can communicate with each other. The stingy man's son tries to buy back the ox for a handsome price, but the owner will not sell. The account concludes by noting that when the ox died, it, it received a proper burial. This is quite similar to another story from the same period from the Grove of Pearls in the Gardens of Teaching, the, the fire in Julin compiled by the translator Dao Shi, um, who died in 683. It concerns one uh, Lu Bo Da, who, owned so who owed someone a thousand cash, but tried to go back on their agreement. As a result, the two men went before a statue of the Buddha and Lu swore an oath that if he did not repay the man, he would be reborn as an ox in their household. Lu dies and a calf is born with the characters Lu Bo and Da in white hair on its forehead. Lu's sons were terribly embarrassed and tried to buy the ox. Um, note that the calf's prior birth is made, through, made clear through its unusual marking, which are meaningful only because the calf was reborn in a place where someone could properly interpret them to recognize the characters and connect it to this other person. The owner wouldn't sell and instead gave uh, the calf uh, to a monk in a local temple to support the construction of an impressively tall stupa. There are many more stories like these two in both Buddhist and popular sources of the medieval period. Throughout these stories, we see that past incarnations are manifested through the features of the animal, and they are born in settings in which someone could recognize the animal, making the anxious entanglement of humans and animals clear. 
I take the manifestations of features from past lives on the oxen to be a form of communication on a continuum with a mel talking milk cow with which I began and behavior such as kneeling. Speech and behavior indicate a kind of conscious awareness of their identity on the part of the animal. Most animals cannot talk directly to their human companions. And so dreams frequently offer uh, animals opportunities to convey messages to humans. Dreams, Dreams in these contexts are not taken to be manifestations of unconscious desires or anxieties, but rather are the space in which beings from different realms communicate. Another story in Grove of Pearls in the Garden of the Teachings has a thieving brother reborn as a piglet of the family sow. When the family needs money, they sell the young pig to be used in a sacrificial offering. After the pig is taken away, the brother slash pig's wife has a sensation of being poked with a snout while she is asleep. The pig thereupon speaks to her, explaining his situation, uh, its cause, and pleading for her help. His mother and children have the same dream, and as a result, the son and elder brother are dispatched in the middle of the night um, to buy back the pig at double the price if necessary. The sacrificial official does not want to part with the pig. How would the ritual go forward? And the family must appeal to a former county magistrate for help. The story goes on, and I will return to how it ends, but the family's action is spurred because of the pig's dreamtime speech. Before that, they had no reason to think that the pig was anything other than a pig, and his communication is judged not only valid by the family, but also by the magistrate. Although persuasion was used, and this was not an official trial, this example raises interesting questions about the legal status of persons reborn as animals. In turn, um, we might connect this uh, to the movement to grant personhood to certain animals, uh, such as the elephant in the Bronx Zoo, given the name Happy. The possibility that a non-human animal might have been or might become a human animal suggests that the line between human and non-human rights may be blurrier than the current human allow law allows for. Indeed, the animal rights movement, at least in the West, must grapple with how to draw boundaries. Elephants are seen as intelligent animals who experience emotions, and these qualities are used by those who advocate for them to bolster claims to certain rights. Similar arguments are made for apes who are deemed like enough to humans to merit legal personhood. The legal scholar Stephen M. Wise makes such an argument, but also asserts that ants and beetles um, are too unlike us to be granted rights. Questioning this kind of distinction, Talal Assad um, in Formations of the Secular writes that Wise, quote, does not employ the notion of overlapping and intrinsically differentiated networks because human right, rights law seems to require mutually exclusive categories, end quote. So to, to decide who gets rights and who doesn't uh, create, means creating categories, and that is a kind of a, requires drawing lines between rights havers and non-right havers, then sort of living with blurry distinctions. Gananath Obeyasekara makes a similar point in imagining karma in that rebirth traditions often uh, assume, quote, the blurring of categorical distinctions. Um, Martha Nussbaum in her most recent work also makes a, a kind of similar point about um, the, you know, the lines that we have drawn. Uh, so stories in which fathers become pigs, and as we'll see, daughters become sheep, suggest how our everyday categories might not be mutually exclusive, as wise would have it. Another story likewise shows the slippage between human and animal in real time, making clear how close animals and humans are. This tale, another medieval one from the record of postmortem retribution, concerns a young girl who is tied across atop a grain husker behind a home where a banquet is about to be held. Noticed by a guest, she weepingly explains that she is the daughter of the banquet's host and that she had died the previous year. Before her death, she had stolen some money and hid it in a wall, and she is now repaying her parents with her lot, Ming. As soon as she finishes with this explanation, that she turns into a sheep whose coloring matches the clothes the girl was wearing. The guest tells his host, they find the money in the wall, the sheep goes to live at a monastery, and the whole family gives up eating meat. Communication between animals and human beings show them as a part of a single community in these stories. Special markings in fur, something that we've seen in some tales, are a more passive form of communication. 
The readability of the latter depends on the animal being born near his or her home in a past life. It is this proximity that prompts change in human behavior. The family with a daughter reborn as a sheep gives up consuming meat let they, lest they accidentally make a meal of a close relation. This is a literal version of cannibalism, the term coined by the philosopher David Wood to signal what he sees as the problem with humans eating other mammals. The animals into which family members reincarnate are all domesticated and live very near to humans. In the case of the sheep and, and oxen, they can be co-laborers with human. Oxen especially seem to elicit feelings of gratitude, debt, and care. Yet pig, pigs, oxen, and sheep are not quite companion animals as we would think of them. They are not pets and they could be readily sold or eaten. This leads to an ambivalent intimacy with family members who have been reborn as animals in these stories. Having a family name show up in the fur of an ox is embarrassing, serving as a constant reminder of a relative's um, misdeeds. The pig who had to be rescued from a ritual offering is not welcomed back by his family, despite the trouble they took to prevent him from being killed. On their way back to their village, his son and brother set him in a field and tell him to run back home. Although this serves as another, yet another verification that the pig is who he said he was in their collective dreams, his two relatives may also not want to be seen with him. This marks a point of contrast with the picture book story about the reincarnated ox with which I began. In many of the medieval tales about humans reincarnated as animals, the ox or other animal goes to live at the monastery when its past life comes to light. This serves the dual purpose of keeping the animal safe from ritual sacrifice or being eaten or being made to do more labor um, and um, of perhaps hiding away the family's embarrassing non-human relation. Importantly, it also act, allows the animals access to the Buddhist teachings, which will aid them in returning to the human realm in their next incarnation. In the picture book, the eminent monk is the family member, allowing for a consolidation of two roles. He is both brother and care caretaker. The story does not comment on how other monks or visitors to the temple regarded the ox brother, but certainly the ox's attentiveness to the Buddhist teachings conveys a moral turn. The monk brother is perhaps less chagrined than other family members, a consequence of more developed comp compassion, we assume, and his insight gained through meditation into the ox's past life. Rebirth stories such as those I have just discussed show us how we are entangled with others. However, they are ult not ultimately about the animals qua animals, and they encourage taking the animal's perspective only in limited ways, often through regret. After all, they have come to their animal status um, because of mistakes made when they had human form. Let's return to the example of the sheep daughter. Even from the few lines that make up the story, we can sense her distress at being made to labor. Her weeping moves us as it does the guest who first hears her story. Her tears are prompted not by, or not just by, the suffering she feels as an animal, but by the regret she feels for her thievery in her previous life. Unlike the humans who vowed rebirth as oxen to discharge debts, the sheep daughter only fully grasps the consequences of her actions once she is reborn. Reflecting on this story, we too might wonder whether our own misdeeds might lead to animal rebirth. To put this more bluntly, we empathize with the ox, the sheep, and the pig, not because they are animals, but because they were humans. We see this clearly in Guard Dog, um, one of the stories, uh, three stories in the Buddhist uh, Tsuji Charity Foundation picture book entitled Heaven and Hell. The story is based on one found in the Agamas, and begins with Buddha out on begging rounds when he stops by the home of a wealthy man. The, the man is not home, but his dog, and the dog is cherished as if a family member with his own special couch. Um, the dog barks at the Buddha. The Buddha scolds the dog, saying, you are one who has been able to get rid of thoughts of greed, anger, and delusion in your past life. You were like this in your present life. You are like this because you have not been able to cut off these bad habits, end quote. This makes the dog very sad and the dog lies on the ground depressed, not responding to his master's call. The wealthy man asks his servant if something prompted the dog's sudden mood change. The servant then mentions that the Buddha had dropped by. 
The wealthy man visits the Buddha who explains that the dog is none other than the wealthy man's father and further adds that this can be proved by asking the dog about valuables that the father had buried. The dog indicates a spot under the couch and indeed the family treasure is found there. The story ends with the wealthy man weeping over the sorrowful fate of its brother. Venerable Zheng Yan's concluding note emphasizes that our mental states, greed and so forth have real effects and thus we should be careful about our thoughts. As with the tale of the prince and the tiger and the other stories I have discussed, this tale of a wealthy man's dog is perhaps not intended to offer lessons about human animal relations, but we benefit from reading it in that way. First, humans and animals can communicate. Both the Buddha and the wealthy man speak to the dog, and the dog shows that he understands through his behavior. In the case of what the Buddha says to the dog, this leads to a further point about dogs, that they, and by extension other non-human animals, have real emotions. This dog can be angry at visitors and made sad by what is said to him. Both these emotions are reinforced through the illustrations, which depict big eyes and an open mouth for anger, and half-closed eyes and a lowered heads for the dog's depression. Finally, humans and animals live in community with each other. And I just want to note that I think many of us who have pets would recognize many of these features as well. It's perhaps not too far a stretch to go from a third-person stance on a dog dogs or oxes emotions to trying to imagine their emotions from a first person standpoint. This brings us to the third type of story, that of transposed perspectives. Rather than centering human points of view, storytelling of this sort asks us to look through the eyes of another species, seeing how they see their world and us within it. Reiko Aonuma in Unfortunate Destiny discusses a set of jatakas in which animals speak noting that these stories fully recognize and give voice to an animal, animal perception of humanity as dangerous, cruel, untrustworthy, and corrupt. Onuma concludes this section with a story in which a bodhisattva translates animal sounds into human language, thereby helping a king to understand the misery of the animals he keeps captive. Without the bodhisattva's super mundane skills to literally translate from animal to human, we need to rely instead on our imaginative powers. We have seen this already in the story of the ants and the chicks uh, discussed as example of unidirectional concern. For both little boys, their care of non-human animals is shaped by imagining their life worlds. Stories of transposed perspectives shape the imagination, not just of their characters, but of their audiences. Picture books very often have anthropomorphized animal characters at their center. And although making animals speak and act as humans may not be scientifically accurate, it facilitates what uh, Melanie Duckworth has called, quote, apprehending the vibrant agencies of the non-human realm. Empathetic, the empathetic imagination of the reader is stretched considerably in books that take the perspective of insects, uh, especially unappealing ones or potentially unappealing ones. Tsuji, so, as part of a series of picture books designed to introduce children to common health issues, has several stories that center on exactly that, the viewpoint of insects. One of these is Little Inn's Adventure Diary um, about a rove beetle. So there are more and less charismatic insects. You know, a ladybug and a firefly, I think are examples of the former. The rove beetle is not, on the other hand, very appealing. Um, when I started reading this, I Googled what a real rove beetle, not in sort of an illustration, looks like. Uh, and I don't necessarily recommend that. I was kind of, they're, they're not attractive insects. Um, as with many picture books, the illustrations are as important as the text. You can get a sense of this just from the cover. Uh, in the story, we meet a family of rove beetles with the mother wearing an apron and the father eyeglasses. In the following pages, we see the kid beetles with backpacks. The imagined conversations sound like re real families with the mother warning her adventurous children to be careful as they go out into the world. The plot is one of travel and return, um, which is a common sort of storybook uh, narrative form. And what gives drama to the adventure are its encounters with humans. They have been warned about humans from the beginning using the term human race, Ren Lei. As I read it, talking about humans beings, us, in that kind of terminology, a quasi-scientific term, creates a distancing effect. 
The young Beatles first meet a child who almost slaps one of their friends. His hand is stopped by his mother, who tells him to gently blow them away instead, as the Beatles have venom that will cause redness, swelling, and blisters. The next encounter with the human race comes in a field where a worker is hacking away at the earth with an ax, causing a swarm of rove beetles to fall up, fly up and crawl away, uh, many of them with, a dis with distressed expressions on their faces. Even though we can see the man's face, he has no features. He has been made as anonymous and undifferentiated as we often see insects. This is repeated later in the book, when we see the two brother rove beetles, clearly different, each with their own expression, flying over a field with bent over faceless workers. This pictorial spread makes clear the switch in perspective. The book as the whole, um, I think, brings about. What if the insects were those with families, feeling in feelings, individuating features, and we humans were an undifferentiated mass? The first field worker we encounter slaps a rove beetle on his arm, leading to a painful red swelling, which is depicted larger than life in the foreground of one il illustration. This and that swelling necessitates both immediate first aid and a trip to the hospital. The rove beetles have also been traumatized and spend time recovering on the forest floor in an environment of layers of fallen leaves, dead trees, and rocks. They encounter other closely related insects who prepare a feast for the rove beetles to help them get over what they've just experienced. Despite their differences, these two types of insects can harmoniously enjoy themselves, and the right environment provides all that they need. Flying home over a field of human workers, one of the young rove beetles can't help but think the human race really has it bad, and reflecting on the suffering of the man with the bl blistered arm, understands why human beings fear rove beetles. He imagines telling them, we won't bite you, don't be afraid, but also don't hit us, we can all get along. This story on the face of it is not obviously Buddhist. There are no Buddha, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, monks, as we've seen in some of the other stories. There's no discussion of merit or other concepts we might identify as Buddhist. Um, yet I would argue that this picture book advances a Buddhist ecological viewpoint. Uh, for the purposes of day, today's talk, I will leave aside how picture books about, bu about bug bites fit into Siji's medical mission. Rather, I'd like to highlight how this story subtly promotes non-killing and also encourages empathetic imagination. Over the course of the story, rove beetles are shown not as, not as enemies of humans trying to poison them with their toxins, but as curious, family-loving, and harmony-seeking. In the same way that rove beetles could get along with other insects, we humans should be able to live peaceably with rove beetles. There is a double perspective taking in this story. Readers identify with the rove beetles as main characters and are meant to experience both their excitement going out into the world and their anguish at being threatened by um, humans uh, slapping them. By the end of the story, the beetles, having observed the human race, can understand why they are afraid of them. The reader takes the perspective of the beetle who takes the perspective of the human. Not hitting the rove beetle that lands on one's arm not only prevents one's own pain, but th that of the beetle. Recognizing our mutual entanglement reduces suffering for all. If the connection through re reincarnation operate across a more than, more than human time scales, the rove beetle story shows entanglements across vast differences in size. Rather than time blocking our ability to perceive our entanglements, for our relations with insects, it is first of all a matter of physical scale. Stories about insects also prompt us to think about our affective responses to non-human beings. Little Inn's Adventure Diary provides a model for what uh, Franklin Ginn has called our, our, our called for uh, that we should expand our geographies to encompass uncomfortable and unloved non-human others. As a scholar of cultural and historical geography, one of Ginn's projects looks at gardeners' relationships to slugs, an unappealing creature that damages plants, and reflects that extending our horizons to the unloved, the invisible, and the monstrous presents an ethical challenge because it is usually difficult to practice empathy with such creatures just as it is tricky to integrate them into residually humanist notions of personhood. Anthrop anthropomorphizing rove beetles erases their difference, but provides an entry point 
into practicing empathy for them. As they're learning about their attributes and environment, which are more fully explored in an afterword to the story. Listening to gardeners and how they react to various means of killing slugs, uh, which are often visibly horrific, uh, Gin observes that uh, acknowledgement of shared but different corporeal vulnerability can prompt ethics to move across species lines. This is what we see happening over the course of this story. The beetles are small enough to be smashed by human hands, but human skin is also easily damaged by the, the beetles. We have different corporeal vulnerabilities. So educational picture books such as these begin what, begin what Gin calls, calls the, quote, process of learning with that marks the beginning of an ethics of living with. Although the examples of transposed perspectives that I have discussed today all come from the contemporary period, antecedents of this approach can be found in two other types of tale, the other two types of tales, which suggest both the continuities of different forms of sentient beings and the web of responsibilities that result. Animals, we have seen, can communicate with human beings in special circumstances, and recognizing a duty to care implies the ability to figure out how to care as when the bodhisattva helps the hungry tiger who will not kill. I have argued here thus far that Buddhist literature, both historical and contemporary, offers distinct ways of telling stories about interspecies interactions. I've identified these three types of stories and suggested that each of this helps us to understand different dimensions of human relationships with and responsibility to non-human animals. To conclude my talk, I'd like to experiment with ex applying these types to, uh, of stories to a news item as a way of thinking through what Buddhist ecological storytelling might have to offer us in the present. So, in late spring of last year, reports began surfacing of orcas attacking boats in the Mediterranean Sea and Atlantic Ocean, with incidents centered off of Spain and North Africa. The orca boat encounters had actually begun the previous year and maybe even before that, but drew more interest as examples accumulated. As it might be already be apparent from um, what I've just said and also from the headlines on the screen, these incidents are usually framed in terms of a conflict. Orcas are most often said to, quote, attack boats. The word appears in many news headlines about the incidents, but are also described as ramming, pummeling, damaging, destroying, and sinking boats. Orcas are also known as killer whales, and the New York Times has described them as apex predators. Continuing the combat metaphors, the hashtag Team Orca appeared on Twitter, which is now known as X, from those who saw a kind of retributive justice in their action. Of course, the reality is more complicated than a struggle between two forces. In the body of stories with headlines about attacks, there's usually a paragraph or two citing whale researchers and other scientists who speculate that the orcas are following a fad and are acting playfully, or alternatively, that a traumatic experience with a boat prompted their current behavior, possibly passed from whale to whale. Some subspecies of orcas are endangered, and they have been recognized as indicator species, animals whose well-being helps us ascertain the health of a given ecosystem. Given this, stories that treat humans and orcas as in combat or conflict is not a useful framing. So how else might we tell this story? As a story of unidirectional current concern, the orcas might be situated on the receiving end of compassionate actions. This is easiest to imagine on the level of the individual rather than the species. We could imagine a tale with parallels to the tiger jataka, for example, in which one person comes to the rescue of a whale in a manner that puts themselves at risk. And indeed, we have such stories. One can readily come up with many videos of whales being disentangled from fishing nets by people on boats or more dramatically by divers. More easily than with the tiger, such pred uh, predicament can be understood as the result of a negative human interventions into the whale's environment. They can only become entangled in tets, tet, uh, nets um, because humans have put the nets there. As with the Jataka tale, such stories highlight how humans have greater agency even as they re recognize a corresponding responsibility. From the perspective of interspecies relationship, unidirectional concern is a kind of double-edged sword. Although it encourages compassionate intervention, non-human animals are the object of such intervention. 
uh, and remain at a kind of remove from uh, human life. Humans are always the heroes of these types of stories. Yet even with what I think are the ethical limitations of such stories, they are superior to those narratives that center metaphors of combat. Considering the category of anxious entanglement, the stories I have discussed show the continued connections of lives across rebirths and how such connections can be helpful in arguing for the value of non-human lives. Thinking, think back to the story of the pig saved by an appeal to the magistrate. Because the pig was once human, it was granted a quasi-legal status. Could we not imagine that an orca would likewise be worthy of recognition as a rights-bearing individual? But we could also expand the scope of retributive connections from the individual to the communal. Climate crisis is the residue of human acts and its impact on human and non-human animals can be understood through theories of karma. In an important essay from 2003, Jonathan, um, S. Walters has argued for distinguishing several forms of what he calls socio karma. Walters began by flagging the quote, inherently social na nature of karma, end quote, um, which becomes clear, um, again quoting him, uh, especially clear when a social group undertakes to perform some joint act of merit or sin, end quote. In such context, a group may be a loose entity, but other social units take on more enduring forms. Walters finds in Buddhist texts examples of political karma and the karma of social institutions. In both cases, karma seems to have a potency that extends beyond the individuals that make up a nation or social institution. However, in that one's participation in nations or social institutions is understood to be a consequence of prior karmic conditioning, we might expect that groups would also receive the effects of actions carried out by social institutions. And before I wanna move on from this, I want to note that the current issue of the Journal of Global Buddhism has a number of brief essays that engage with Walters and karma in different modes and in different geographic locations. So understanding collective, uh, understanding collective karma should change how we think and act. Reading through scholarship on Yogacara Buddhism, philosopher Jessica Locke uh, comes to conclusions that I think build on Walters' insight. Our ethical selfhood is porous, she writes, um, and we should take seriously the concepts, categories, and classifications that we employ, as these will contribute to a mutually reinforcing cultural and psychological feedback loop that shapes both individual and collective karma. For Locke, the contempor contemporary model of transformative justice can be understood as a, quote, practice of col collective karmic intervention. Returning to the orcas, we can then read the disruptive behavior of the orcas as a reflection of environmental imbalances caused by humans. Our anxious entanglement is on a species level. And so rather than recognizing individual personal obligations to a given orca, we might respond on the level of collective karmic intervention. This might mean looking for and altering those human systems that have disrupted patterns of orca life. Narratives of transposed perspectives have the most promising uh, have the most promise for cultivating empathetic imagination, altering our understanding of non-human others and our relationships with them. For imagining the perspective of whales, I turn to Talia Lakshmi Kaluri's uh, story, collection of stories entitled What We Fed to the Manticore. Each story in this collection is written from the standpoint of a different animal. Although not about an orca, her open ocean, the open ocean is an endless desert, takes the perspective of a young whale migrating to a southern breeding ground. Whales, like other marine animals, use clicks, whistle, whistles, and other calls to communicate with each other Seems with sounds better. potentially traveling hundreds of miles. But human-made machine noises disrupt this communication, and Kalori's story imagines the impact of noises and how disorienting they are to the whale. Here is a brief passage. Three gray whales slip by me, humming a warning song about an orca. I can hear the coastline and the shape of the water as it presses itself against the shore over and over. Small fish dish, di dart in and out of the coral gardens that ring the islands bursting from the sea. And I hear the sound the water makes as it slips along the body of my beloved. I can hear everything, everything. And then, and then it arrives. Ish, 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 ish. Ish, ish, ish. The note, the ship returns and it grinds out the detail of the world. 
As the sound fills every drop of water around me, the lush world I have just come to disappears. The trenches fill, the coral just crumbles, there is nothing and I am alone, suspended and directionless in an empty chamber. I turn to swim one way and then send out a few notes to see where I am, but all that comes back is the flat sur surface of ish, ish, ish. We cannot know what it is like to inhabit the mind of a whale whose sensory realms are so different from ours and whose communication does not take the shape of any human language. Yet by putting ourselves alongside the whale, uh, as Kulari asks us to do here, we begin to empathize with the changes wrought by what has been called the Anthropocene soundscape. Whether or not the orcas of the Eastern Atlantic Ocean are having experiences like that of Kulari's fish, fictional whales, Trying to imagine their experience might help us develop ways forward that see interspecies relations as something other than combative. Whales are charismatic megafauna like elephants and pandas and thus receive more human attention if not always care. As we have seen, uh, multi-species storytelling can extend to more humble animals and beyond. Honeybees, beetles, plankton, fungus, microbes. These are all essential for life on our shared planet but challenge our imagination in various ways, from scale to affective re reactions of disgust or dread. These differing scales are important. As I noted at the beginning of my talk, Amitav Ghosh has observed that the modern novel has seemed to be ill-equipped for the kind of storytelling required by the climate crisis. The climate crisis produces improbable events but it is also operates on a time scale that is difficult for us to grasp. The types of multi-species stories that I've discussed today provide an on-ramp or access point to new types of stories. They ask us to think through the life worlds of other beings, but also to consider extending our temporal understandings backwards and forwards from our own experience. The imaginative exercises prompted by Buddhist stories can lead from thinking about the impact of one lifetime to the collective karma of many centuries and our varied entanglements across those years. The narrative th themselves, as we have seen, can be retold and rewritten for different times and places. Um, we saw tales from fourth century scriptures become contemporary picture books. So I believe that this multi-species storytelling is an important resource, not just for Buddhist ethics, but for all of us thinking and acting in the Anthropocene. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this fascinating talk. I'm still kind of drenched in the sound of the water. Uh, and it reminds me of um, uh, of an art piece, Bergen, uh, which is called Adaptation, which I just seen in the Jeu de Bombe in Paris. Yeah, uh, something very similar, like uh, the video shows you the ocean and um, um, a back uh, of a woman who's um, dressed in a enclosed kind of cloth and she stands there. What we can hear is only the sound of the ocean. So anyway, thank you very much for this uh, very inspiring uh, lecture, especially because um, uh, in the last year, I tried very hard to uh, think along with um, the mechanical men in Buddhist literature. Um, yeah. So your uh, methodology really gives me so much new thoughts upon it. Maybe I can um, ask you further questions like after this lecture um, and I really wish I had all those picture books uh, when I was a child <laughs> okay before um, playing too much I don't want to like him um, blurring here so let's first welcome Venerable De Yuan uh, to share her thoughts on this um, talk please okay thank you Professor Chow dear Professor Hader Professor Yin all online audience good day to everyone it is my pleasure for me to be here sharing some of my thoughts. I was very happy listening to the wonderful sharing by Professor Hiller. I benefited greatly from it. As for today's topics, I will entangle others, Buddhism and multi-species storytelling. I would like to share some stories as well. And according to the Buddhist Sutra, the Buddha observed 84,000 life forms in a bowl of water. Even over 2,500 years ago, the Buddha already knew that there were substances 
invisible ecological rhymes within this work. The tridecorism, the collection of one billion words described in the Buddhist Sutra, has been verified by modern astronomy as our galaxy. From modern scientific research, we can see that the Buddha had in need thoroughly realized everything about our world and the universe within his wisdom, fear, and awareness. And my teacher, Dhamma Master Zheng Yan, often tells the story about how the Buddha looked into a bowl of water and seeing that it's contained in innumerable living beings, his heart of compassion was aroused. Similarly, we must show compassion for all sentient beings. This compassion should extend even to microorganisms that are invisible to the naked eye. We must respect, love each other, and not interfere with each other. Just now, Professor Halo shared that in the Buddhist storytelling, the material she has read suggests three types of narratives, unidirectional concern, anxious entanglement, transverse perspectives. I will be sharing three stories and hope it can align with the three types of narratives as shared by Professor Hader. First story is to show how compassionate an animals can be as compared to the human. This story may align with transpose perspectives. Professor Haler said that we have seen how animals can communicate with human beings in special circumstances, and recognizing a duty to care implies the ability to care for others. So there was a country where there were herds of deer living in a forest. The deer king, whose coat was multicolored and radiated golden light, led the deer in the peaceful life in the forest. Unfortunately, things never last. One day, a human king charged into this peaceful forest with a group of hunters. The herds of deer and all the other creatures in the forest Blow in panic in all directions. The forest was no longer peaceful. The deer king was deeply pained. His heart ached when the king and his hunter saw out each day. How could he bring harmony and peace back to the forest? After considering this over and over, the deer king decided to leave the forest alone and went to the crowded city. He safely arrived at the palace. The king saw the deer king kneeling down on all four legs. The king asked, What do you want from me? The deer actually began to speak. Tears falling from his eyes, explaining the forest was no longer peaceful. I came to you today in the hope that your majesty can tell me how many deer your kitchen needs each day. I will send that number of deers to your palace on my own accord. Please do not bring hunters in our land anymore. The king granted the deer king's request. Don't worry, I need only one deer each day. No one will disturb the forest anymore. The deer king went back and gathered all the deer to announce the agreement with the king and say, this is a very worthy sacrifice. The herds of deer had deep faith in the deer king. So they together came out with the list and went to the palace accordingly. One day, the deer king arrived at the palace kitchen. The cook saw that it was the deer king himself. He right away went to tell the king. The king asked, Have I eaten all the other deer in the forest? The deer king then told the king about a female deer was pregnant and no deer would like to replace the pregnant deer. As such, he said, I am willing to be killed in the place of that female deer. After hearing that, the king felt deeply ashamed. Such a benevolent king could be found among the animals, whereas he, a king among humans, 
took the life of others to satisfy his own cravings. The king sincerely praised him. You are better than me, though you are an animal. It is as I merely have the appearance of a human. From now on, I will ban the hunting and killing of animals, protecting the lives of all beings. The king kept his word, and the forest flourished with life once again. The dear king was a previous incarnation of Sayabodhi Buddha. Whenever he manifested in the six rhymes, he always taught by example. The second story is a true story that happened in year 2011, which made a life with anxious entanglement. This real story was about how Chuchi volunteer brought Cheng Mingzhe become a vegetarian. Previously, he would go crazy over famous car and delicious food and always enjoy a luxurious and sophisticated lifestyle as his life's objective. As he recalled in May 2011, at one time, he bought an eel. He when he slaughtered it. Although the body and head of ear were already separated, the ear bit his hand and refused to let go. His hand was bleeding nonstop, so she, he has to quickly disinfect and wrap out the hand. Then the maid in his house came and took over the task. When the maid took over to cut the ear, her hands were also beaten by the ear. She was very scared and eager to pull off the ear by force and end up having to be sent to emergency ward to have six stitches. At that time, Brother Chen was very frightened. He realized the truth of karmic retribution, which made him become humble and modest. Later on, he participated in the performance of the musical adaption of the Samadhi Water Repentant in year 2011. He was even stronger believed the law of karmic retribution. He no longer wished to create evil affinities with sentient beings, so he vowed to observe vegetarianism to form life after life. The water-dependent text stated that even after 10 lifestyles of spiritual practice, Master Wu Tao was unable to escape the negative karma created in one lifetime. For every action, there is retribution, so we must be very cautious on our action. The third story happened in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and tells about how a father changed his mindset in order to help his newborn baby. He may, this may align with the category of un unidirectional concern. His baby named Zile born, was born in October of 2020 and was diagnosed with Kabuki syndrome. He had to stay in the intensive care unit with the whole body intubation. The baby has no anus and had ureter obstruction. Within eight months, he has gone through seven operations. As his parents, what should they do in order to help their child? His parents started to post about the baby's condition on Facebook and appeal more people to take on a vegetarian diet. He started to ask everyone to have 100 vegetarian meals. Many people couldn't bear to see the baby's pain, so a lot of people respond positively. A vegetarian food store sent out 100 vegetarian food packs a day in Zhile names until the baby was discharged from the hospital. From February to September 2021, a total of 100,000 vegetarian meals has been eaten in his name. After eight months, the baby was still dependent on the oxygen tubes but the doctor allowed the baby to be discharged from the hospital so that he could be home with his family, including his grandparents and sleeping. Then, miraculously, Zhile started getting better. Let us look at some of the pictures shown. 
Yeah. And you can see that from one year old, two years old. And now he is already three years old, three years and three months year old. His parents were sure that this was a result of all the blessing he received from so many people eating vegetarian meals. This story very much aligned with the story of the eminent monk who saved a nest of ants and is in this way prolonged his life. Professor Haler shared that a seeding 1.5 degrees of warming may seem inevitable. But perhaps the effect of our action may be more far-reaching than they appear. The above three stories show that we should all encompassing love to animals by taking on a vegetarian diet. A vegetarian diet not only reducing killing and respect life, but also protects the earth environment. If the demand for meat can be reduced, there will be no need to cut forests into pasture for large-scale building. And it can also reduce the problem of animal agreement contaminating land and water sources and reduce the emission of greenhouse gases. Professor Haler also said, climate crisis produces improbable events but also operates on a time scale that is difficult for us to grasp. The type of multi-species stories that has discussed today provide an on lamp or access point to new type of story. They ask us to think through the life worlds of others being, but also to consider extending our temporal understandings backward and forwards from our own experience. So I wish to conclude with my master teaching. Dharma Master Chen Yen often shared that since we humans are the most intelligent of all the beings in the world, we all the more need to cherish our life, to say nothing of our own human life. A truly valuable life is one where we have a sense of respect for other, ourselves and can follow the Buddha's teachings to cleanse our minds of ignorance and afflictions. We should also be grateful for everyone around us. Each person is like a mirror reflecting our own strengths and weaknesses. We need to make good use of our strength as much not afraid of correcting our mistake. If we can be a beacon of life for others, though the way in which we live, then we are making the most of our life. Not only are we benefiting ourselves, we are also bringing blessing to the world. In closing, I sincerely wish that we can all change our eating habits by taking a plant-based diet in order to protect our earth and hope everyone can stay healthy and happy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Venerable De Yuan. Um, maybe before um, Professor Heller's response to your speech, we can first welcome uh, Professor Lei Yin for her discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Zhao. Um, I also want to thank Professor Heller for a captivating talk. I thoroughly enjoyed it, um, even even despite that I read the script uh, some days ago. I also want to thank Venerable Devian for your thoughtful comments. Okay. So can I would like to share some thoughts of mine. I would like to begin with an anecdote about the reader's response to the famous Jataka story of Prince Mahasava sacrificing himself to feed a hungry tigress, a story Professor Heller has just discussed in her talk. This reader is Zhou Zuoren, Lu Xun's younger brother and a humanist thinker, whose prominence was no less than his celebrated elder brother during the May 4th period. In humane literature, a landmark essay published in New Youth in December 1918, Zhou remarks on the Jataka story. Quote, as for slicing one's flesh to feed a vulture, or offering one's body to feed a hungry tigress, 
Those are feats of suprahuman morality, which lie beyond what ordinary human beings are able to do. Unquote. To be sure, Zhou was not troubled in Buddhist ethics. In his youth, Zhou read Buddhist texts published by the Jingling Scriptural Press while studying in Nanjing. He was deeply moved by the Bodhisattva ideal. Decades later, Zhou recorded this experience in a poem referring once again to the Jataka story. Quote, Offering one's body to feed a hungry tigress. What an awesome deed. Yet the feelings are more than authentic. Again and again, I read this tale in my life, full of gratitude and on the verge of tears. My admiration notwithstanding, this is beyond my reach. I hereby keep it as a motto. Joe's response was a complicated one. As much as he appreciated the lesson of the tale, he maintained a critical distance, and he insisted that one cannot expect ordinary human beings to live up to such a moral standard. Joseph's response illustrates at once the success and limit of the edifying power of Buddhist narratives to a modern reader, which is the central preoccupation of Professor Hallow's talk. Her chosen theme is animals, a theme that strongly resonates with us in an age of a climate crisis. And as we become increasingly aware of human arrogance and myopia in the Anthropocene. And the talk addresses not exactly animals per se, but animals and animality as represented in Buddhist narratives, both traditional and modern, canonical and folkloric, accompanied sometimes by pictorial illustrations. Bringing a wide array of Buddhist literature into conversation, Professor Hallow's study rediscovers the contemporary relevance of the Buddhist literary and artistic tradition. In her sensitive close reading, Professor Hallow reminds us that the legend of unmatched compassion, this feeding the tigress legend, can nonetheless be anthropocentric. And our ingrained bias, that is, we tend to see some animals as more equal than others, more lovable than others, and this kind of bias makes it hard for us to recognize an entangled other in the first place. As a literary scholar, what I find most engaging is Professor Hallow's sustained attention to the narrative form. Why do stories matter? Why do we love reading stories? As Professor Hallow skillfully argues, Buddha storytelling contributes to cross-species thinking by cultivating empathetic imagination in the reader. This is indeed a distinctive forte of the fictive genre, which enables a vicarious experience in the reader. In other words, as a Turkish novelist and Nobel laureate, Orhan Pamuk put it in The Naive and the Sentimental Novelist, quote, novels are second lives, end quote. Fiction helps us see ourselves in others and see others in ourselves. Nonetheless, I would add, we should not take such vicarious experience for granted. Or take the novel form, for example, in a novel, that is a narrative form that is complex and fluid. One does not just find a hero, exemplary or not. One finds many voices, or heteroglossia, in the words of the Russian literary critic Mikhail Bakhtin. To read a novel, observes Bakhtin, is to, is to experience, I quote, the dialogic imagination in a field of valorized perception, end quote. Readers do not always reach a single or intended lesson or conclusion. What a literary masterpiece exactly teaches can be elusive, and it seems better that way. For obvious example, how many readers would claim that they read the story of the stone so as to relish the Buddhist teachings of impermanence and emptiness? What do we do with stories? And what do stories do to us? And this question is constantly on my mind as I study literature as a vehicle for ethical reasoning and spiritual reflection. Here, I wish to revisit a story in Professor Hallow's talk that I find particularly provocative. That is the story of the novice who saves the ants. The story enacts a subtle parallel. The novice, who sees the danger awaiting the ants, intervenes out of compassion 
has helped change the fate of the ants. The elder monk, who foresees the misery awaiting the novice, intervenes out of compassion and hence helps change the fate of the novice. As the narrative unfolds, readers come, readers come to grasp the chain of events right, and the underlying karmic causality. But this knowledge is not necessarily accessible to the characters in the story. Through a juxtaposition of different perspectives, the story reveals an intrinsic ignorance as a shared condition of the earthly characters. Well, the ants probably know the least. And then for the boy, in a cosmos of interdependence, the boy who saves the ants knows not that he has also been saved by the ants. And for the eminent monk, we as readers outside the story cannot help but wonder what karmic destiny awaits the eminent monk whose clairvoyance gets overwritten in real time. This story is all inspiring, not just because it demonstrates the law of karma. In my reading, it dramatizes a profound benightedness in all mortal species, a condition of finitude that is virtually impossible to overcome. It is this finitude that compels us to be humble, reverent, and open to our entangled others in view of our collective karma. Such awareness, which is imbued with inescapable anxiety, as well as radical hope, prepares us, I hope, for uncertain, if not grotesque, future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Lane, for your thoughtful comments and reflection on this whole talk with further uh, sources from your own research. Thank you very much. So uh, let's welcome Professor Heller to respond to the uh, discussions. Yeah, I want to thank um, both discussants for their comments. Uh, and I really appreciate the way that both of them drew in different stories. Um, Du Yuan emphasized, I loved the, the reference to the Buddhist, Buddha observing different life, uh, life forms in a bowl of water, um, which, yeah, I agree is an incredibly potent image and one that we should keep in mind, um, as well as the, you know, the, the sharing the stories that show how I think rich the Buddhist tradition is in these kinds of narrative resources. And then what I really appreciated about Do Yuan's comments um, were the way in which she brought in two sort of modern examples uh, that you could read th these modern examples through the kinds of typologies that we see in narratives. Um, you know, the story of Chen Mingzi's kind of conversion to um, um, vegetarianism, and then the Malaysian story about the, the young um, boy whose fate was transformed through uh, the consumption of vegetarian meals. Um, I think that one of the things that those modern incidents or these modern examples really show is how stories help us interpret our worlds, right? Um, that they um, they can be used as kind of narrative forms that help us when we look out at our environment to think and the, what's happening around us to think about like, well, how do I understand this? Um, and what, what kind of action um, should be prompted? Right, like, and I, I, now that I'm speaking aloud, I want to see if I can find this. Um, right, you know, we talked about the entang, like Lori Gruen, going back to the quote I had from her, right? The, to get an accurate take on the situation of another and figure out what, if anything, we are called upon to do. And it seems to me that having sort of the resources of stories in the back of our minds and being familiar with them allow in these kind of contemporary moments uh, to look out at the world and figure out what it is that we are called upon to do. Um, and, um, you know, uh, Lang's also comment about how this story was really uh, affect you know, the story of the the Mahasattva Prince Mahasattva and the Tiger was really a, affected uh, uh, Zhou Ren and the the problem of superhuman um, morality. Uh, characterizes sort of pointing to the success and limits of these stories, right? Like, are these something that um, we can sort of take on? Um, 
And one of the, the passages that she, she said something that I wrote down very quickly that I really liked, uh, which was that uh, we see our, you know, these narratives allow us to see ourselves and others and others in ourselves. Um, I also appreciated the way in which she pointed to novels um, and those novel, you know, novels that offer oftentimes much more complex stories with these kinds of multi multi perspectives, right? And you know that there are different kinds of stories. Not all stories need to have these kinds of tidy endings where we can see exactly what happens, right? Um, and I think, you know, thinking about that, I think that's true. Like we go to literature for many different reasons, right? Um, and that you know, these the various literary forms. Um, you know, it can be for entertainment, they can be for edification, they can transform us. One of the, I think, the kind of strengths about shorter narrative forms, often which have this kind of conclusion, is that they, they, they allow the kinds of transference, that we can kind of capture them. Um, and actually, you know, when I did read your comments ahead of time, right, one of the things that I thought of when I was reading through that is that there's a phrase that comes up, and I haven't been able to trace the origin of it, um, but it's this expression that stories are sticky. Um, and when I was looking for where this comes from, it seems to be used a lot in sort of business, right? Like um, that if you're trying to create an ad campaign about something or, you know, convey uh, health information, right? Stories are sticky. And that's useful because then they get carried with you um, or they get carried with whoever is hearing the story. Um, so I think that um, one of the advantages of, and you know, and uh, thinking about that and the stickiness, and I apologize for rambling a little bit, but you're know, kind of thinking through this aloud, right? Like novels stick with us, I think, in a different way than stories stick with us. Like those kind, of, uh, like a short narrative sticks with us. You know, I'm thinking about a novel that I read over the winter break that I couldn't, like the story of the stone, I couldn't really capture what that novel did to me in in a few sentences. Um, and so then that's a, that's a kind of different effect. It, but when you read a Buddhist story, you can see that, like the, of some of the ones that I've talked about, you can think about, well, you know, the next time you walk, um, or, you know, it rained a lot here yesterday. And as I was walking down the street, I actually saw like a little slug trying to make its way across a watery path. And so when you think about when you have these kinds of stories in your head, it actually, I think, as Dillian has shown, can transform how you interpret those worlds. And so that we have sort of different, I guess the, the, the conclusion to what I'm trying to say is that there are different types of stories and different lengths of stories that can have, have different kinds of effects. Um, and I also really appreciated the comment at the end about sort of intrinsic ignorance um, and, you know, the kind of the question of what we can know about what others know. One of the really interesting things about uh, picture books is that there's a moment in child development when um, children begin to recognize that, that there are other minds and that other people know things that they don't know. And that sort of development of that knowledge of other minds comes about kind of right at the moment that that, that picture books are intended to um, be part of. Um, so I, I think that's a really, you know, one of the things that these stories kind of play around with is, you know, can we know what it you pointed to? Like we probably know the ants probably know the least, but we also probably know least about what the ants are thinking, right? Um, but we can use these kinds of stories to begin to play around with from the developmental age and then when we return to them of the different levels of knowledge um, and what we can think about that. So I, I would I think I'll conclude my comments there. Um, in, but also to just really express my gratitude uh, for both respondents for their really careful engagement and thoughtful engagement with my talk um, and for giving me more to think about as uh, I continue to think about these issues. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Heller. Uh, Professor Lane and Venerable Duin, do you have further comments upon that? Oh, I see. So, um, um, so if not, um, maybe, yeah, please. Oh, I see. Sorry, so, please. Um, 
I just wanted to comment briefly on different narrative forms. That was exactly what I try mm -hmm. to grapple with uh, in writing up the comments. Uh, so I very much look forward to reading Professor Hala's new book about uh, children's picture books in Taiwan. Right? So in a sense, they carry on what we have always talk about in the study of modern Chinese literature, save the children, 救救孩子, right? So I very much look forward to seeing how Buddhist picture books uh, give us a new generation of mindful children. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, um, I've noticed that uh, Dr. Her has, has been listening very attentively. Maybe uh, do you have comments on the lecture as well? Well, it's, a, it's an extraordinary uh, insightful uh, presentation from Professor Heather and the storytelling on the animal and the entangled with the human race is really transform our compassion and empathy to... <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Transform our compassion and, and empathy to our... Uh, to all the essential beings. So I think um, it is worthwhile to transform this ancient story into a more a modern style. As uh, uh, Master De Yuan uh, talk about the real story that happened in Shiji, especially all the volunteers, um, you know, men, men mentally transformed from the um, uh, eating meat to vegetarian. I think as uh, also Professor uh, Yinglei is saying that uh, the storytelling is really important to inspire human being to, you know, treat all animal equally. So I think we do need more modern story and to convey the Buddhist philosophy and the spirituality that we have to work in for that. And you're all welcome to come to Taiwan to look at those uh, children book, we are going to provide you more about that, and uh, and hopefully that we also uh, can co-write the book. As um, we have a committee um, meeting with our advisors, especially uh, Professor Richard Gombridge from Oxford University, and he suggests that we are not only uh, you know devote to academic research. Actually, we need to have those research. The uh, to the younger generation, especially for the young, for them to learn the philosophy. That's from uh, his uh, suggestion. So I think uh, for the children to learn the philosophy, uh, storytelling will be the best way for them to uh, catch the uh, ideal and, and build the spirituality. Thank you all. Thank you all this insightful for uh, sharing and, and, and also those research. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Heather and Professor Ying Lee and uh, Dharma Master Deo Yuan. Thank you very much, Dr. He. Uh, Professor Heller, would you uh, like to say a few words? Sorry, I forget, uh, failed to unmute myself. Um, there was a question posted a little bit earlier uh, from the YouTube mm. uh, from a YouTube viewer, yeah. I wanted to connect with uh, Dr. Ho's comments, which is, you know, like why, why, um, you know, if Buddhism as Buddhist philosophy um, applicable to reality, why has Buddhist philosophy had so seemingly so little influence in Western countries? And you know, I was thinking about that as uh, as these very co various comments were going on, and I think in one one answer is that you know to create the distinction between Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist narratives, right? Um, and you know, I was thinking about this also in response to Professor uh, Lang's comments. Um, we, what, there was a moment a, a few months ago where I was thinking about a children's book that I had read and no, no longer have as a child. Um, and, you know, I couldn't remember the title, but I Googled enough of like about the story to be able to figure out what it was, could find it. Um, and online, there's this, of course, this whole generation of people who remembered this story with you know, real fondness, and it still has stuck with them, you know, like, what, 40 years later, right? So the, the potency of that kind of story. So I think this gets to um, what Professor Hill is talking about in terms of different ways of communication can have different 
different effects on different audiences and that they're all kind of useful that and you know personally as someone who works on uh, picture books and children's literature I think that these are some of the um, most impactful stories that get told um, in part because they are coming at a moment when um, children are using stories to start to tell themselves stories about the world as we saw um, you know, and those stories can have real effects. Um, and in part, because sometimes these picture books will get read over and over again. Um, they're communicating through sort of multiple mediums, right, that we have. I didn't, for very reasons of copyright, I didn't show a lot of illustrations from the picture books, right? But to have, you know, these images, and I think that many of us uh, online could probably think back to kind of specific images um, from our childhood that not only the stories stay with us, but those those images stay with us as well. Um, so I would, uh, I guess, concur with kind of the potency of different kinds of communication forms uh, for, um, you, you know, bringing uh, Buddhist ideas to new audiences. I hope that was what you had in mind. Um, Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, Professor Heller, just answer the question from you too, for uh, Jimmy, you maybe he has heard your answers now. Um, Ted, do you have other uh, questions from you too, maybe? Uh, yes, Professor Zalbert, uh, we do have another question from YouTube. Uh, I wonder if you can see the uh, comment section in the chat. Mm -hmm. I think the the question is uh, uh, written in Chinese. I think uh, Professor Hader has been answered those questions in her presentation, and I suggest the um, uh, this guest can take a look at the um, uh, video. I think all this question has been presented by Professor Hader in her speech. That's a suggestion. Yeah, thank you. So another question. I have two questions uh, regarding the research. Can I jump in after the question? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, where is the question? Uh, can you help me? Yes. Yes, uh, yes, please. Sorry, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, thank you all for such a fascinating lecture. And uh, Oops. Maybe you should turn off the um the camera the video so maybe. it yeah. can be more clear. Turn off your camera and only audio. Maybe your signal will be better. Okay. Um, okay. I think he's stuck. Maybe before he comes back, we can <laughs> chat a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So my um, small question. So since uh, Professor Helen now is working on um, arboreal temporalities with human uh, beings um, on the trees, etc. Uh, when you look back onto those cases um, regarding animals, is there any categorical difference between um, those Sorry. plants and trees, et cetera, and, and those animals in Buddhist literature when they try to think along with different objects and things and um, sentient beings after all? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. And uh, to be honest, I don't feel like I'm far enough along in my research to have a definitive answer. Um, mm -hmm. And But I think that, and one of the reasons that I was interested in plants and trees was because, um, you know, it seems to me that like the how animals should be regarded is relatively more clear in Buddhist literature mm -hmm. and Buddhist philosophy, okay. and that trees and mm -hmm. plants um, represented what is sometimes called an edge case 
um, that they are, mm -hmm. you know, that they don't fall neatly into different categories. Um, mm -hmm. And so by way of a kind of a quick answer, I also think that what I'm seeing thus far is that we, there's probably a useful distinction between an individual, like some trees take on, and you can probably think of this in your own environment, some trees take on um, a, like a kind of individual nature uh, mm -hmm. and some trees remain as a kind of indifferent, what undifferentiated mass. And so in that, mm -hmm. they might be kind of, you know, I think that that has led me to also being kind of fascinated by how insects are treated, right? And these smaller mm -hmm. things that yeah. I tend to think of as, you know, in between like I've, shut, I've yeah. shut myself away from my four cats, right? But otherwise they would be like trooping across here and I can sort of assert different personalities for those cats um, in a way that mm -hmm. we wouldn't necessarily... Um, when we come across those ants who need to help crossing um, a puddle, um, we would be less likely, I think, to assert, you know, in, um, personality or individuality to those ants. So thinking through those kinds of issues of sort of um, the the group um, and, you know, undifferentiatedness, uh, as well as the, the individual um, and how individual trees can come to carry um, meaning on their own. So that's just kind of a beginning tentative answer. Hopefully I'll have a better answer for you Thank in you. about three years. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I think Mr. Sun is back. My computer just died. Can I have another try later? Yes, if you're there, please maybe open a mic without yes. camera. <laughs> maybe that's yeah, better. Yes, please. Yes, and uh, Hi, Professor Heller and the other organizers and discussants. So this is Hao Lun Sun from McGill University. And yeah, glad to see you, Professor Heller, and again. And thank you so much for such a fascinating lecture. And I really appreciate all the like efforts from the organizers and the participants contributing to the lecture. So uh, during the lecture or before the lecture, actually, like when I think about the Buddhist storytelling about animals, the first one pops into my mind is uh, Journey to the West, which is, of course, a novel fall of the animals. But the stories you just, you just provided really opens my mind on like the category of the Buddhist storytelling a lot. And with these stories, I have two specific questions. Like, one is about the typology. So I was wondering whether there are stories from the perspectives of Buddhas or Bodhisattvas in addition to the divide between human and animals. Because I was thinking like in like when we're talking about stories, there is another version of another genre of text in Buddhism, the sutras. And these sutras are usually told by Buddhas or Bodhisattvas, and sometimes will cover the animals like um, like uh, maybe the birds in the Amit Amitabha's pure land so there are sacred birds and they are the like the they rep represent the purity of the land of Amitabha and uh, I was wondering whether like your ideas on the um, like the perspective of Buddhas or Bodhisattvas and another question is about like how we can think about the effects of the contemporary storytelling about animals in Buddhist practices um, like um, as you have said like the there are effects or the purpose projected to the Buddhist storytelling and I was wondering like can we look at the storytelling and the like the gain that we can perceive in the real practice like the live releasing, the pilgrimage to a Buddhist site, or like the stories just shared by Van Brodewin. So like how we can think about the relationship between the storytelling and these practices. So that's my two questions. Thank you. Thank you. Those are really interesting questions. On the first one, which I, uh, as I understand it, is on like sort of where do we get the perspective of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas on animals? Um, and you raised the and uh, the issue of like birds in the Pure Land, um, which of course are you know kind of I mean I think bird like I didn't actually tell any bird stories, and now I've, I'm kind of regretting that because um, I'd want to think more about birds, right, uh, as and what they represent. And I think to the answer to your first question, I'd have to say that I would I would need to think more about it and do a little bit more research 
um, but noting that like the birds in the Pure Land are kind of their own thing, right? That they don't behave, they're not like birds in the real world. Um, so um, I'd want, uh, I think that's a good question and something that I, I think I would want to think more about before coming up with a, a kind of answer for. Um, as for your question about sort of essentially the effects of um, storytelling on, you know, on practices, um, you know, that question in a connection with, you know, venerable, uh, the, the anecdotes that Venerable Dillian brought to us, I, I think actually pre presents like a possible um, mode forward for someone who was interested in sort of taking this and taking the potential typologies and seeing what, how they work in the world. And this would be a kind of ethnography that like I myself am not trained in, but I think you could do, you might be able to do it in a couple of different ways. One is that like many of these stories, as we know, like circulate online, um, either in, you know, video form, uh, excuse me, um, or, you, you know, uh, through media publications of various sorts. So you could read through a bunch of those examples and think about what the, what the kinds of stories are being told within those. Essentially emulate um, Venerable Dillian um, in identifying like how those stories might li li link up to typologies that we see in written and transmitted narratives. Um, and so, and you could do that as a kind of live ethnography as well, in terms of listening for people's stories as they talk about, um, as you sort of pointed to visits to pilgrimage sites um, and how they are um, thinking about maybe their activities within that. So um, thank you both, you know, I don't know if those are effective answers to your questions, but I thank you for both of those questions. I think they were really stimulating uh, as to potential directions uh, this re kind of research could um, uh, go in. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Sun. Thank you, um, Professor Heller for the responses. Um, there's further, because our time is almost up, uh, there's one question in the chat box. Is in Buddhism, we talk about the fact that the perfect human body is hard to attain, obtain. Um, does Buddhism also believe that humans are superior to all species? Maybe just a, a quick response to before we uh, close. Yeah, um, I mean, that, that's a great question. And I think that uh, the kind of the answer to the question is a little bit implied in those stories of unidirectional con concern, as well as the, the stories of um, entangled, uh, anxious entanglement. Um, yeah. In so far as that, right, like in the understanding of sort of where we, one is reincarnated, I think I made reference to the notion that the reason that families were kind of um, yeah, unhappy with their relatives was that because animals, you know, is understood traditionally as being a lower rebirth, right? Um, and that that um, means that attaining a human birth uh, reflects um, a, a kind of virtuous standing. Um, so um, yes, in, in, in that sense, uh, you would say that he, um, Buddhism b believes that those who inhabit human bodies have, and let, I might modify it that way, um, are at a superior point than those who inhabit animal bodies. I don't think that that um, diminishes um, the need to think about those different bodies. And in fact, I think that that's kind of implied with um, the, the notion of reincarnation is that we need to be able to recognize that we too could move through di diff different kinds of bodies. So maybe I'll okay, stop. Thank it. you very much. Yeah, we perhaps have to stop here for today. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Heller. And we're really looking forward to your book to come out next year, is it? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, many thanks to Professor Elaine and Venerable Duyuan, to uh, Dr. Her and Professor uh, Wong to be here and to be so engaged in this uh, wonderful lecture. So maybe it's time to say bye bye for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Ted. Thank you, Professor Heather. Thank you, Professor Ying Lei and Professor Wang and Dhamma Master Duyuan. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you all for the organization. Oh, yeah.
情。